Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 13 on the trace minerals. So we've covered the water soluble vitamins and the fat soluble vitamins and the major minerals. So now we're moving on to the trace minerals. Remember, trace minerals are as important as the major minerals. You just need a lot less of them and there are a lot less stored in your body. So we are talking about milligrams, you know, low milligram numbers, below 100 milligrams. And we're even talking about micrograms in some situations. So trace minerals, it's talking about the amount that you need, not their quality or their importance. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in with the icebreaker. Many of us are familiar with major vitamins and minerals. Are you familiar with trace minerals? Which can you name and where do we get trace minerals from? So I don't know which ones you can name, but uh, uh, when I when I think when you think of the trace minerals, most people know that we need iron, and many people know that we need iodine. Look at like iodized salt, right? And um, selenium is my favorite one from the list, but uh, uh, so I'm not sure how many you can name now. But hopefully, at the end of this hour, you will be able to name more of them. And where do we get minerals from? We get them from the same place we get our trace minerals. We get them from the same place we get all minerals, which is from the soil, right? So uh, remember that, uh, you know, the elements on the periodic table, which is what your minerals are, uh, were made in stardust uh, at some point, And uh, that's what our, our planet's made of. And we extract minerals from soil, rocks, water, these types of things. Um, and that's where this idea of contaminants comes into play too. So if you're, if you're getting mineral rich, rich water, you're probably getting some of the minerals you want, but you're probably getting some of the ones that you don't want too. We'll look at things like lead and cadmium and these types of things at the end of this chapter. All right, so our learning objectives. Number one, summarize the key factors unique to the trace minerals. Uh, number two, identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the essential trace minerals, which would be iron, zinc, iodine, selenium, copper, manganese, fluoride, chromium, and molybdenum. So we'll, we'll obviously there's a few that we'll spend way more time on than others. Some of the other ones will just kind of fly through because they're easy to find and we're not worried about toxicity or deficiency, etc. And then describe how contaminant minerals disrupt body processes and impair nutrition status. So what, what's the problem with getting a little bit of lead or cadmium with your calcium, for example? All right, let's do this. The trace minerals, a quick overview. So the trace mineral contents of foods, this is an important point, vary with soil and water composition and food processing. So we know that food processing can, can remove nutrients, including trace minerals, but the soil and water composition is a very big deal. Uh, for example, when we talk about selenium, I will tell you that the best food source of selenium is Brazil nuts. But that's just not any Brazil nut. There's nothing magical about Brazil nuts. They have to be grown in selenium rich soil. So Brazil nuts from Brazil, I know have a lot of selenium, but I don't know if uh, Brazil nut is grown somewhere else, else if that's true. So it's the, it's the soil composition of selenium that causes those Brazil nuts to have a lot of selenium. So the water that you're using with plants, the soil that plants are growing in, that's what's going to determine the mineral composition. Uh, other examples, like we'll talk about uh, actually a selenium deficiency called Kaishan disease, and that comes from, no matter what they're eating, it comes from living in a region in China where there's just not enough selenium in the soil. So even if you grow things there, there won't, there's not enough selenium to pull from, so we, ha we have issues there. All right, um, so deficiencies can affect people of all ages and may be difficult to recognize. Some we just don't even really know enough uh, about them yet to know um, what to look for. Uh, and then toxicities with the trace minerals that's not regulated by the FDA in the same way that it is with other nutrients. So here we see just a comparison with some of these nutrients of the RDA or the AI. Remember, if, if, you, if you can't set an RDA, then you, then you make your best guess or educated guess, which, is, which would be the AI. So comparing the RDA or the AI and the tolerable upper intake level, the UL, um, for selected trace minerals, and you'll see that um, uh, the, the first bar, the top bar, is the RDA for, for young adults. Uh, the green bar is the UL compared with the men's RDA and the, what is that, orangish, yellowish bar, the UL compared to women's RDA. So um, usually there's a little bit of wiggle room there between, you know, the floor and the ceiling, right? This idea of adequacy and mo moderation. So there's uh, it, it, the, the, the minimum dose you need is quite a ways off from the maximum dose, but not a huge number. So you notice that most of the time there isn't a ton of wiggle room. So what that means is, but, but normal people eating normal typical diets will uh, not have to worry about these upper intake levels. This is where you get concerns if you're starting to supplement and you're, and you're taking just too high of doses of these types of things. 
Uh, like for example, I don't know, just some people supplement with zinc, especially during cold and flu season. Uh, I don't have any problem with that. I, I take zinc when if I feel like I'm getting sick or if someone I've been around has been sick, but I only do it for a few days at a time, right? When you're using when you're using these um, supra physiological doses, these higher doses of nutrients, I recommend um, keeping the time period pretty short. Try to get try to get the benefit of a higher dose of something when you think it's necessary, but don't do that forever. All right. Interactions, so nutrient interactions, trace mineral interactions, uh, they, they, they are common and well coordinated to meet the bodily needs. So that just means that, again, we're, we're not supposed to be consuming individual nutrients. We're supposed to be consuming foods. And you will see that there, that there are interactions in the food that we eat that, that tries to, to normalize mineral levels. And then also you'll see that your gut does a really good job of deciding how much to absorb of something, whether to uh, actually transport those minerals into the bloodstream or kick them out into your fecal material. It's a, it's a pretty cool system if, if I'm being honest. But these interactions can sometimes lead to nutrient imbalances. So if you're getting way, if you, if you have a diet that's way too high in one mineral, for example, it can impair the absorption and use of others. We'll see like the relationship between zinc and copper and these types of things. All right, so an excess of one causes a deficiency in another, uh, but going back to your major minerals like calcium and magnesium compete for absorption. So a high, a high calcium diet can impact magnesium status. A high magnesium diet can impact calcium status. Uh, uh, these nutrients are not just not cause, just causing deficiencies, but they can interfere with how they work. And you'll see that's a, that's a big problem with lead, right? So lead can can uh, basically take the place of other minerals, and, that, and that's a very bad thing. Contaminant minerals and toxic reactions. Lead's the biggest one we'll talk about there. I mean, lead, uh, you know, lead-based paint or um, lead in water. I mean, these are these are serious issues. That you know, thankfully, there's been a lot of progress removing lead from gas and paint and these types of things, but uh, we still have a long ways to go. Okay. Then we have what are called the non-essential trace minerals, which you'll find in your body and you will find in foods, but uh, we just don't know what they what they need, what what they what they do, or if they're necessary. So that's things like nickel, silicone, vanadium, cobalt, and boron. Let's go through the trace minerals. So the first one, which I think is definitely the most important one, is iron, and that's because iron deficiency is the most common nutrient deficiency on the planet, and we'll talk about why. And iron has lots and lots of important functions. So you see, there are two types of iron here. Uh, I'll make sure I have my documents here. All right, there are two types of iron. We have ferrous and ferric iron. So I, I don't care about their their chemical formulas, but uh, um, ferrous iron would would be a two plus and ferric would be a three plus, but the key is ferrous iron is found in animal products and is more bioavailable, meaning you will you will digest and absorb more of it than ferric uh, iron that is found in, in plant-based sources, basically. So we'll, we'll focus more on the terms heme and non-heme iron. All right, so iron is a cofactor to enzymes involved in oxidation reduction reactions. If you remember those terms from metabolism, um, when you when you oxidize something, it's when you peel electrons off of it. When you reduce something, is when you add or transfer electrons to it. So so anytime there's this movement of, of electrons, uh, then iron's involved. Iron is involved in the electron transport chain to make ATP, which remember ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency that our cells use, so clearly important. But the main reason we talk about iron is this last point here. We need iron to make hemoglobin and myoglobin. So hemoglobin is about 96% of the protein that's in your red blood cells. So I think of hemoglobin almost like a, a wedding a wedding band um, with a, I don't know what they're called, I don't know much about jewelry, but, but, the, but the thing that holds the, the setting, that holds the diamond, um, hemoglobin is designed to hold iron, and then that iron is what gives hemoglobin its affinity for oxygen. So hemoglobin is, its quaternary structure to review, is four different subunits that make up hemoglobin. That that carry oxygen or carry iron that carries oxygen or transports oxygen. Myoglobin would be like a single one of them. So myoglobin is almost like the the hemoglobin in your muscle cells. So your uh, your, your slow twitch fibers, your postural muscles, they have a lot more myoglobin. So that's that's why they can uh, they're built for endurance. All right. So iron is very important for hemoglobin and myoglobin, which are the protein in red blood cells and muscle cells, like I just said. All right. 
more iron is absorbed when stores are empty. So one of the cool things about mineral absorption is your is your body is really good at this. Uh, the more you need a nutrient, the the more of it you will will be absorbed into your bloodstream. And the less you need, your body tries to protect you by limiting absorption. So that is a, a very important point. We'll look at what happens at the level of the gut in just a moment when I show you an image. But um, ferritin is just some terminology here. Ferritin is an iron storage protein. And then I so but iron as it, as you consume it as it's digested it's actually absorbed into intestinal cells where it's stored and then it, if the iron is needed it gets passed into the bloodstream if it's not needed well every three to five days your intestinal cells are sloughed off and they will be sloughed off with those minerals if not needed so it's a protective mechanism if you absorbed all the iron you ate we would be in deep deep trouble so it's great that your body has these systems to to minimize absorption um, iron is something that pathogenic bacteria are always looking for so we, we want to make sure we have enough iron but the last thing we want to do is have ample iron around more than we need that can can cause um, bacteria to flourish microbes to flourish so iron is stored in those mucosal cells, and if it's needed, then it's going to be passed uh, to the transport protein, um, transferrin, amongst others. So uh, the transferrin is the storage protein, which it releases to that transport protein. If iron is not needed, the cells are going to be sloughed off, like I just mentioned, in fecal material, and that happens uh, on a constant basis. Your intestinal cells are constantly being replaced, and that's, that's why uh, that's, it's really one of its protective mechanisms. All right, so let's look. This is a really good picture. So we take the iron from our food, like looking at that plate, we'd see there'd be some heme iron in the meat as well as non-heme iron. There'd be non-heme iron in the, is that broccoli? In the broccoli. Uh, so the iron in our food is taken up by the mucosal cells in the intestine, and they store that iron as what's called mucosal ferritin, which is a storage protein. If your body needs the iron, then mucosal ferritin releases it to mucosal transferrin, which is a transport protein, which then releases it to an actual transferrin in the bloodstream, and now it's being transported through your bloodstream to go where it's needed. If that iron was not needed, then the iron is never absorbed. It's excreted when the, when the intestinal cells are sloughed off into the, into the intestine and carried out in fecal material, that excess iron goes with it. So the same thing with other nutrients is pretty cool, uh, other, other minerals. All right, so heme versus non-heme iron, very important terms. So, you see, so heme iron, think animal products, non-heme iron, think plant products. So you see here about 40% of the iron in meat, fish, and poultry is bound into heme, the heme version. The other 60% is non-heme. So there is non-heme iron in, in animal products too. But notice that we're looking at meat, fish, and poultry. We're not, we're not talking about all animal products here. Uh, but all the iron in foods from plants is non-heme iron. So heme iron, you see here, is absorbed better. So heme accounts for only 10% of the average daily iron intake, but it is absorbed up to 25%. Non-heme iron it is the majority of the iron you're going to be consuming today, but it's absorbed less at about 17%. So heme iron is more bioavailable than non-heme iron. All right, and we have a couple more little facts about that too, something called meat factor we'll talk about in just a moment. But let's match these first. You can pause if you want to try yourself. So found in plant and animal foods is non-heme iron because remember, not all animal, uh, not all the iron in animal foods is heme, but so you find it in both. Um, heme iron has the highest bioavailability. Heme iron is found in animal foods. Heme iron is 25% absorbed. Non-heme iron, 17% absorbed. Influenced by dietary factors, that's going to be non-heme iron, and we'll look at some of them, like, like fiber. Fiber is a big one, and then another one I'll mention in just a moment at the bottom of the screen. And then non-heme iron, vitamin C actually improves its absorption. So if you're trying to get more iron into your bloodstream because of anemia or low iron stores, then vitamin C will increase absorption. If you're not, if you have a condition like chemochromatosis where you have too much iron, then you would want to avoid vitamin C uh, or minimize your vitamin C intake uh, to minimize iron absorption. So this is a good or bad thing depending on what your iron status is like. All right, so animal products also contain a peptide, which is actually called meat factor or meat factor peptide that enhances non-heme iron absorption from other foods eaten in the same meal. So that, that's a big deal. So basically, if you ate that steak and that, and that broccoli, the uh, meat factor that was in the, in the steak would actually increase the absorption of the non-heme iron in the broccoli. All right, some sugars and acids also can enhance non-heme iron absorption. Stomach acid's a big deal too. So dietary acid, stomach acid, acid is needed to properly digest foods to get at the iron in the first place. 
All right, factors that inhibit iron absorption. So we'll go through this, then look at the list on the left-hand side. So a little longer list. Uh, let's see, let's start with, um, all right, iron, let's just start with the hemoglobin and blood cells at the bottom. Iron-containing hemoglobin in red blood cells is doing its job, carrying its oxygen. Some of that, um, some of those, some of that iron would be lost it, with bleeding. So whether it's like GI bleeding or any kind of bleeding, but um, uh, menstrual bleeding is, is is one of the main reasons that you'll see that women of reproductive years need um, more iron than than someone that isn't um, menstruating. And, that, and that's a really important point: is the menstruation is the key, not the age, right? So if, if you're not menstruating, that does impact um, your iron needs. All right, then uh, you'll see here when the red blood cells after 120 days, when a red blood cell needs to be basically recycled, the liver and spleen will dismantle red blood cells, package the iron into transferrin, that transport protein, and stores excess iron in, in ferritin and something called hemo hemosiderin, but ferritin's the key. So remember, transferrin is the iron transporter, ferritin is iron storage. There are some losses via sweat, skin, and urine. So we are we we that's why even as someone that's not bleeding, like a non-menstruating female or a male or whatever, um, you you do have iron needs because you you can't trap and keep all of it. Some of it's going to be lost. All right, the transferrin is going to carry the iron in the blood. Will be delivered to to the myoglobin of your muscle cells plus taken to your bone marrow to make more hemoglobin to make more red blood cells. And then we're back at the beginning. So what are some things that inhibit iron absorption? Phytates, which are found in legumes, rice, whole grains. So phytates and oxalates are examples of anti-nutrients. Uh, they're, they're compounds found in plant products that impair the absorption of nutrients. If you're eating plenty, I mean, this is, this is the reason that um, non-heme iron in plant foods is less bioavailable or one of them, but uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, the proteins that are found in soybeans and nuts can also inhibit iron absorption. So you, again, you're seeing a strike against plant-based foods for, for as your primary source of iron. Uh, calcium, which is found in milk, so dairy products also are going to inhibit some of the iron absorption. And that's why you go back to the, the poultry, fish, and, and meat uh, were being the best sources. And then something called polyphenols. These are antioxidants. They're not they're not bad, but they do they do inhibit absorption of iron. So they're found in things like uh, tea, coffee, and red wine. Maybe tannins would be an example, something like this. So these things do impair absorption. So what does this mean? If I mean if you're if you're trying to impair absorption, then you would want to have tea and coffee and these types of things with your iron-containing meals. If you're iron deficient, then you may want to limit your consumption of these types of things while uh, you are consuming iron. All right, um, iron deficiency. So I already mentioned this earlier. The most common nutrient deficiency worldwide. Uh, main main reasons being uh, that you know think about the number. Of, uh, there's about eight billion of us, getting close to eight billion of us on the planet now, and lots of people for. Um, Cost, availability, cultural, religious reasons don't consume animal products, which are going to be um, your best source of iron. And then, then, then bleeding any. So think about um, someone that has parasitic infections that cause uh, bleeding in the GI tract or uh, a menstruating female. So you're losing, you're losing iron in ways ways you don't lose other nutrients. And uh, there may be primary deficiencies just because you're not consuming enough of it. All right, so even small blood losses can cause deficiency, which is why you'll see that the, the needs for iron for a menstruating female is more than double that of a male. Deficiency develops in stages because remember we have, um, you have a storage form of iron, you have iron being transported and iron being used. So you won't see a deficiency at the level of the iron being used until those other depots have been impacted. So iron with iron storage, so serum ferritin levels will drop first because that's stored iron. If you don't have enough iron, then you get rid of your stores first and that's when you'd see your iron stores start to drop. Um, and then after that, you'd see a decrease in the transport iron transferrin. So ferritin levels will drop first, then transferrin levels. If you're out of stored iron and out of this transported iron, then you don't have the iron needed to make red blood cells. And you see your hemoglobin levels go down and hematocrit levels go down as well, which is hematocrit is a measure of the percent of hemoglobin. All right, and that's when you would see iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. So if your iron stores are gone, you'll see low hemoglobin levels. Symptoms of anemia, I mean, it basically means without air. So uh, if, you, you, if you have, um, let, let me show you a picture that shows you what they look like. If you have iron deficiency anemia, you're going to have, uh, your red blood cells are going to be too small. That's called microcytic anemia. And they're also going to pay, be pale because they're not, they're not carrying as much iron and making them hypochromic. So those red blood cells just won't function as well as the normal red blood cells, which you can, you can read there, but you can see on the left-hand side how red blood cells develop. Um, 
without iron, it's just not going to not going to work properly. So you're going to have a, you're not going to be carrying as much oxygen, and that's going to lead to uh, mental and physical um, issues. So you see some of the symptoms here. Behavioral symptoms, energy metabolism is impaired, oxygen is needed for all ATP production, so or, or not all, uh, glycolysis is an anaerobic process, so you can make two ATP without oxygen, but you need oxygen to make uh, the total uh, ATP that you can get from glucose, which is 36. So energy metabolism would definitely be impaired. Uh, neurotransmitter synthesis would be altered, so that can lead to some mental issues as well. Reduced work capacity and mental productivity, even just running low on fuel. Your brain is extremely metabolically active and needs a ton of oxygen. Uh, motivational problems, again, you're, you're tired for very good reason. You know, if you're iron deficient, it's basically like, imagine going from, you know, I'm here, you know, at sea, sea level to Denver or something. You're not going to feel great. You're going to have a headache. You're going to be tired because there's less air up there. It's called the mile high city for a reason. So that, that would be like what you would feel like at sea level because you're not, your, your ability to transport oxygen is diminished. Uh, pica. So when you create a uh, pica is the craving and consumption of non-food substances. So if someone is craving non-food substances like dirt or clay, that that is often believed to be linked to a mineral deficiency. All right, now on the flip side. So iron deficiency is very common, but iron overload, uh, the most common genetic condition in the United States is called hereditary hemochromatosis, which is an iron storage disorder where you store way too much iron. And this can this can damage the liver and do all sorts of things. But the liver is the, the big concern because this uh, you can reach toxic levels of iron there. But it is the most common genetic condition in the U.S. Um, again, uh, so signs of really free radical damage and li and liver liver damage would be the big ones to look for. Uh, your transferrin transferrin is saturated. Your ferritin levels are 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 really really high because you're storing too much iron, uh, and the, and that that this would be a problem. So how would you treat it? Uh, interestingly. The best treatment that I know of is just donating blood. So I, you know, I know people that have um, really severe hemochromatosis. Instead of being able to give blood every few months, they give blood every week. Now I don't think they actually use the blood like a blood bank. I don't think they use it, but that's I'm not sure. I've been told in the past that they don't. But uh, um, so you know, imagine giving blood every week. Every time you give blood, you will have to dip into these iron stores. So giving blood is a phenomenal treatment. And then from a dietary standpoint, you'd want to go on a low iron diet and also a diet that avoids um, excess. You wouldn't want to get scurvy, but avoids excess vitamin C because of how it impacts iron absorption. So you'd want to decrease the, absor the, the consumption and digestion and absorption of iron and then get rid of iron through um, donating blood. All right, that's hemochromatosis. Iron and chronic diseases. There's, so there's a few interesting ones here. Um, heart disease has been linked to excess iron because of free radical damage. Now, I think this is a, this is a really important point to note. I don't, again, I'm not, not saying this with certainty. But, so um, women of reproductive age that menstruate have lower risks of heart disease than men matched for the same age. So you could make an argument. Now, of course, the you know estrogen and the other uh, quote unquote female sex hormones could be cardioprotective, but um, you can make an argument that um, the fact that a woman is keeping her iron stores lower by menstruating could be the reason that uh, women have lower heart disease risk than men until menopause, right? So this is where, so after after menopause, you start to see changes and the risks of dying of heart disease start to kind of match between or equalize. So until menopause, women have a women have something that or, or some combination of things that protects them from heart disease. After menopause, things start to change. So could it be? Uh, it could be the fact that um, after your last menstrual cycle, you would now be storing more iron. That could be it. Uh, it's probably a combination. But I also think, and I think that the changes in sex hormones are are certainly changing disease risk. And a third one is after menopause, um, females generally start to increase the amount of abdominal or central obesity or adiposity that they have, which would increase the amount of visceral fat, which is the stuff that's really really dangerous, uh, very inflammatory, etc. So I don't know, but iron might have something to do with that. That's why generally, if some if I'm counseling someone, and this is not medical advice, if I'm looking at my own. Um, you know, blood, blood levels. Um, I, I want to be in, in the low to moderate range of normal when it comes to iron. I don't want to be on the high level of normal. I like to be in that kind of in the middle or the lower end when it comes to um, my iron status. Not deficient at all, but just I don't need the tank topped all the way off because excess iron does, can lead to free radical production that's, that may increase risk of heart disease. Um, same thing with cancer. Not as much evidence here, but but still, uh, that's why I don't I don't recommend having too much iron um, unless there's a reason to, I guess. Um, 
so iron poisoning, it's made, again, that, that free radical damage and lots of other things, but this is, this is a big deal. I'll tell you, like when I was a kid, um, you know, this is why you see concerns about, well, not concerns, but to, well, yeah, concerns. You have childproof caps on things like vitamins and stuff. Uh, the one, the, the, the biggest concern would be, would be iron poisoning. When I was a kid, I actually needed to get my stomach pumped because I got a hold of a bottle of Flintstone vitamins and consumed all of them. So for, you know, the, the extra vitamin C, the extra B vitamins, they would have all been passed right through me. The other ones, not a big deal, but the biggest concern was removing that excess iron from my system. All right, so the, so the recommendations here, you see men, 8 milligrams a day. Women of reproductive age need 18 milligrams a day. So if you're, if you're pregnant or capable of becoming pregnant or menstruating, your iron needs are going to be increased. Now, of course, if you have very heavy menstrual flow, maybe you need more. Very light menstrual flow, maybe you need less. I mean, these, these, are, these are great recommendations to start from, but you've got to have to play, play with those things a bit. All right, let me see what I have here for my, uh, on my, other, my other lists I've been using for this unit. So iron is a nutrient of concern for young children, pregnant women, and women capable of becoming pregnant. So those are the people that would have the increased need for iron. Uh, it's needed for energy production, growth and development, immune function, red blood cell formation, reproduction, and wound healing. Uh, 18 milligrams a day for, for those groups. Uh, food sources, beans and peas, dark green vegetables, meats, poultry, prunes and prune juice, raisins, seafood, Whole grain enriched and fortified cereals and breads. We should probably talk about those words. We haven't, we haven't yet, I don't believe. Enriched versus fortified. So um, when a food's been enriched, you're basically putting nutrients back that were lost during processing. When a food's, food's being fortified, you're adding nutrients that weren't there to begin with, at least not in those levels. All right, so what else do I have here for iron? And you can look at the list of all the food sources they give. Look at can canned clams right there. Uh, you know, so uh, clams are off the chart in lots of nutrients. You see the uh, beef liver there as well. So iron, necessary for proper hemoglobin function as part of your metabolic electron carriers. Talked about that. Iron is what gives hemoglobin molecules their affinity for oxygen. The two kinds of iron are heme and non-heme iron. Heme from animal products is, is more bioavailable. It is important to have adequate stomach acid to digest and absorb iron. So as we get older, um, that can impact our iron needs because we're, a lot of people lose stomach acid with age. Um, iron, along with uh, many other minerals, are sensitive to anti-nutrients like the phytates we mentioned earlier. Best food sources, beef liver, oysters, clams, red meat, and nuts. So speaking of clams, no, uh, you know there, there are people that believe that um, you know, if, you, if you're a vegan, you don't consume animal products. Um, clams are kind of like on that dividing line. Are they uh, are they animals, right? There, uh, as far as I know, they're not sentient. Um, so there are people that make an argument that clams um, would fall more in the category of non-animal. So it might be a kind of food to look into if you're looking for a really nutrient dense food, but you do not consume animal products. Something to consider. All right, next we have zinc. So zinc supports the work of hundreds of proteins. Uh, stabilizes cell membranes, stabilizes DNA, both obviously huge, huge deals. Important for immune function, uh, that's probably what we'll focus on the most. Uh, growth and development as well, zinc zinc's needed for sperm health, etc. Uh, so it's needed for the synthesis, storage, and release of insulin. Uh, it's important in blood clotting. It's needed for thyroid hormone function, and it, it, it can impact learning performance and behavior if you don't get enough of it. So I uh, I gave a presentation about malnutrition in the brain a couple years ago, and that was something that surprised me. I knew there are lots of nutrients like iodine that we that I knew we'd be talking about, but zinc uh, absolutely can impact learning performance. And if you're if you don't get enough zinc during critical times in development, uh, you may not be able to undo some of that damage. But the immune function is a big one for me. Like the first when I think of zinc, that's definitely the first thing I think of. Um, I I do you know we'll, we'll talk about it shortening the duration of a cold and things like that. But zinc is in something that we here at the house we call the cocktail where um, if we if we feel like we're getting sick or someone is sick, then we increase we increase our intake of, of zinc. And I would say generally every two to three hours take a small I would take a small dose of it. Again, not medical advice this is what me and my family do. Uh, while we also increase our intake of vitamin A, vitamin D and vitamin C, as well as the amino acid lysine, which appears to have antiviral properties. That's kind of what we call the cocktail around here. All right, um, so zinc absorption, the rate varies depending on the amount consumed. So like, uh, again, the more, the more you need, the more you'll absorb, uh, the more it's available or the less you need, the less will be absorbed. Uh, it can either be used or retained in the intestinal cells like we saw with iron, and then, and then it can be recycled through the, 
through the small intestine and also through the pancreas. So we've talked about enterohepatic circulation before. Enteropancreatic circulation impacts zinc, and that's because zinc is needed to make digestive enzymes, which are then squirt into the intestines. So let's look at it. You take the zinc from your food. Uh, the mucosal cells in the intestine will store the excess zinc in what's called metallothionine. And then um, if the zinc is needed, it will be released into the transporters in your body, in your blood, which are albumin and transferrin, albumin being the big one there, and transported throughout your body to the pancreas, where the pancreas will use zinc to make digestive enzymes and squirt it into the gut. So it can, so it'll actually get dumped back into the gut. And then if needed, it will be reabsorbed. That's that enteropancreatic circulation. If your body does not need the zinc, then it just stays in those intestinal cells. Remember every three to five days, that's, those cells are sloughed off and those uh, excess minerals will be lost. All right, zinc transport and deficiency. In the blood, I just mentioned it's carried by albumin, which is a, which is a critically important transporter in your blood. Uh, it's called a plasma protein and transferrin. Deficiency is widespread in the developing world, and, you'll, and you, I think you'll see why when you look at the, the best food sources. Uh, again, it's going to be things like red meat and organ meats and seafood, and, and those are not consumed in many parts of the world, at least not enough. Um, the Mid Middle Eastern diets inhibit zinc absorption, just has to do with other nutrients that are around as, as well as anti-nutrients. So the effects of zinc deficiency, growth retardation, so slow, slowing the growth process, impaired immune response, I don't know how much, but, I, but a significant amount, and um, central, nervous damage, central nervous system damage if the deficiency is, is large enough. But growth, development, immune response, those are the key ones for me. So zinc toxicity, can we get too much zinc? Of course we can, we can get too much of anything. Um, too, this is what I mentioned earlier about how getting too much of one mineral might impact others. If you have a very high zinc diet, it'll impact copper metabolism. And you'll see that we do need copper. Um, this is what I was saying earlier with supplementation. Like if I, if I supplement with zinc, I mean, a bottle of zinc is going to last a couple years uh, because if I supplement with zinc, I'm doing it for two or three days just to try to prop my immune system up while it's fighting something off. And then I go back down to normal dietary patterns. All right. So zinc is found in protein-rich foods. You see here shellfish, meats, poultry, milk, and cheese. And I think now you can see why, you know, some diets would be would be deficient. Um, see what I have here from the, from the FDA page. Oh, I have it. Until I organize, damn, look, it's the last one. All right, so zinc uh, needs 15 milligrams a day. Uh, functions, growth and development, immune function, nervous system function, protein formation, reproduction, taste and smell, and wound healing. So food sources, I mentioned the, the best ones there, but then beans and peas, beef, dairy products, fortified cereals, nuts, poultry, seafoods like clams, crabs, lobsters, and oysters, and whole grains. And then I just have a little bit here. Uh, its primary role is in gene expression, so that's why it's in, important for reproductive health as well as immunity. Uh, not getting enough zinc plays a definite role in increased infections. I mean, one study found that uh, just by um, reaching normal zinc levels, you can reduce pneumonia by 30, 33%. Again, I wouldn't take it to the bank. It's only a single study, but interesting. And then I already told you the best food sources are animal-based, red meat, organ meats, and seafood. So... You do see you know, supplementation programs. If you're not going to consume these types of foods in the diet, then supplementation is important. And may shorten the duration of the common cold, which is why I use it, just to hedge my bets if I'm trying to, like I mentioned before, prop my immune system up. All right, so you can go ahead and look at this list of foods. You see more seafood there on the list, though. From a nutrient density standpoint, if you were building a diet, a food pyramid, whatever, if you're building a diet based on nutrient density, to me, the most nutrient dense, well, not to me, it's, it's science, but um, the most nutrient dense foods on the planet are organ meats. And number two, I would put seafood. If you're categorizing just large groups, I would put organ meats and then seafood. And then I'd put other animal products and vegetables and things like that below that. All right, iodine. So iodine is an important one, uh, mainly because we need it to make thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is made out, made out of the amino acid tyrosine plus the mineral iodine. It's actually iodide by the time we use it, but um, I just like to call it iodine. So the GI tract converts iodine that's in your food into what's called iodide, and iodide is what's absorbed by the body. And then you'll see that you know you do have your thyroid hormones are called T3 or and T4, uh, which is T3 is triiodothyronine and T4 is thyroxine. 
until the T3 and T4 tells you how many iodides there are. T4 has four. Uh, there's an enzyme that can lop that fourth iodine off, making it a T3. So T4 is almost like a storage form of thyroid hormone. It's the most numerous in your body by far, but T3 is more metabolically active. So iodine's key function is that it's part of thyroid hormone, which you see here is very busy, regulates body temperature, metabolic rate, reproduction and growth, blood cell production, nerve and muscle function. We think of thyroid hormone, we think of metabolism, but thyroid hormone basically signals to the body that you have enough energy to do things like grow and reproduce. So thyroid hormone is way more important than, than you may think. <clears throat> All right, iodine deficiency. So if we, you know, iodine deficiency uh, globally, the most common cause of hypothyroidism or low thyroid hormone levels is iodine deficiency. Not true in the United States because we've we've iodized salt and so we've fortified foods, but uh, but globally it is. In the U.S., the most common cause of hypothyroidism is an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But iodine deficiency can still be a big deal um, here because, uh, you know, as you'll see, we iodized salt um, because goiters were a big problem in the U.S. a few decades ago and iodine deficiency was very common. So we iodized salt, but then we told people to stop using salt because, you know, obviously we, uh, the average American eats consumes too much sodium. So we may not have chose the perfect food um, to fortify if we were going to tell people to stop using it. But uh, uh, they haven't listened, I guess. So that's that's the good news. But um, it, it, so if you're um, if you are on a low salt diet, it will impact the amount of iodine in your diet. And then there's also over the last few years, you've seen this real push for um, you know things like sea salts, right? So like we get the Celtic sea salt that was sun dried on the beaches of France or something, right? I always say my salt has had a better life than me, but um, um, sea salts, uh, those types of salts do not have, they're not fortified with iron, usually, iodine, sorry, usually. Some are, but just be careful when you when you, when you you buy salt, um, are, you, are you buying the iodized or non-iodized salt? Because some people don't like the iodized version, like for baking and such. And if you're buying sea salts, just remember, unless it specifically tells you that iodine has been added, uh, there won't be very much there. All right, so if we don't have enough thyroid hormone uh, or iodine, we won't have enough thyroid hormone. Your body responds, responds by releasing something called thyroid stimulating hormone to increase iodine uptake. Thyroid stimulating hormone it comes from the pituitary gland. So if you go to the doctor and you're iodine deficient, they would see low thyroid hormone levels, high thyroid stimulating hormone levels because your body's trying to, get to, to find the iodine it needs to make thyroid hormone. A goiter, so if you have a continued deficiency, it can lead to a goiter, that's a swelling of the thyroid gland. Basically, your thyroid gland will upregulate and, and, and the, it, it'll be inflamed, but also it'll be growing. Um, it's, it's trying as hard as it can to make thyroid hormone. It just doesn't have the building blocks to do so. So cretinism, so during iodine deficiency during pregnancy is a serious, serious problem. Like you see here, an iodine deficiency during pregnancy leads to irreversible physical and mental retardation. So the brain will be smaller. Uh, there will be uh, accompanying issues there. There'll be physical growth issues as well. So super, super important that um, women that can become pregnant have enough iodine globally. Uh, one one uh, analysis that I saw showed that um, this is such a big problem that if every woman on the planet that ever became pregnant um, ha had enough iodine in their diet that the average human's IQ would be up, would be five points higher uh, because of the impact of cretinism. So I, I don't know, you know, it's just an interesting way to look at it, but super, super important. So iodine is important for everyone because of its impact on thyroid hormone, but critically impor important during pregnancy, growth, and development. Iodine toxicity and sources, so we'll look at that. Um, toxicity does interfere with thyroid function and enlarges it. That's the, one of the weird things about nutrient toxicities. They often mimic deficiencies because a deficiency would interfere with thyroid function and enlarge the thyroid gland. Um, so goiters and infants with getting, getting too much iodine. Uh, let's look at our recommendations here and our so sources. So you see seafood and iodized salt. Um, the sats, you know, the, mo the most common way that the, a typical American would get would get iodine would be from would be from the salt. But you've got to keep that in mind because if you're not if you're not using iodized salt, then that's not true. It's not inherently in salt. It's been added. So iodine needed for growth and this is from the FDA site needed from growth and development, metabolism, reproduction, and thyroid hormone production needs 150 micrograms a day. Found in breads and cereals uh, if they've been fortified. Dairy products, iodized salt potatoes, seafood, seaweed, and turkey. So you can get, you know, you can get it from seaweed and these types of things, but um, a typical person the, the, with a typical diet doesn't consume a lot of these, these products. All right, let me find mine. I'm mainly just talking, I'm mainly just talking about the iodized salt thing here. 
All right, iodine necessary for the production of thyroid hormone, important for growth and regulating metabolism, said all that. Best sources are saltwater fish, sea vegetables, and iodized salt. Uh, deficiencies are common in diets that limit salt intake. So if you, if you, if you're, if you cut your salt intake in half and, that, and iodized salt was your main source of iodine, then you would be consuming less iodine. So something to consider. If you're on a very low salt diet or you don't use iodized salt, you know, make sure you're getting some of these other foods in your diet or else uh, you know, check, check your intake using MyFitnessPal or Chronometer. And if you're not getting enough, then maybe you should supplement. Uh, let's see, iodine deficiency can cause goiter. We already said that. And kelp. Supplementation is a good idea for many people, or you can consume seaweed and consume kelp, those kind of things, but um, something to consider. All right, selenium. So I mentioned this being one of my favorites. Uh, selenium is a substitute for sulfur in some amino acids. So we can get, so selenium can be found in methionine, cysteine, and cysteine, the uh, amino acids. So it's, it's, it's a very powerful antioxidant. Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's the, it's the most powerful intracellular antioxidant we have, meaning it's a, the most powerful antioxidant, or it's, its role is in the glutathione peroxidase system, which is the most, most powerful intracellular antioxidant system we have. So glutathione peroxidase, very good at neutralizing free radicals, needs selenium to do its job. Uh, so the enzymes also activate or inactivate thyroid hormones, so selenium intake is, is, is linked to thyroid function. So where it's found in the soil, I mentioned that earlier, right? So the selenium, the, the selenium in the soil is the only th only way that we get it into our plants or the animals that ate those plants. So it's found in soil, meats, milk, eggs, and Brazil nuts. Uh, not just soil, like uh, like uh, the, you can get a lot of selenium from fish that came from you know leaching of the of the rocks and, and stuff that are in in the oceans. And there's uh, soil there too. So soil, meats, milk, eggs, and Brazil nuts. But remember, the Brazil nuts need to be grown in Brazil or grown in other places that have a lot of selenium in the soil. I mean, just a, just a handful of Brazil nuts a day, if, if they're grown in selenium-rich soil, would be enough to, to meet your needs. So how much do we need? The recommendations, uh, the RDA is set to make sure that we can maximize our glutathione peroxidase activity. So where does that put us? So selenium from the FDA site, antioxidant, immune function, reproduction, thyroid hormone function. Need 70 micrograms of it a day. I, I generally shoot for a little more, but, but again, that, remember the, R, the, R, the RDA is the floor, the bare minimum. You know, 150, 200 micrograms a day sounds like a good number to me. Um, eggs, enriched pasta and rice, meats, nuts like Brazil nuts and seeds, poultry, seafood, and whole grains. And what do I have on my document? Uh, best food sources, Brazil nuts, again, from Brazil, organ meats, seafood, grass-fed beef. A crucial part of the, the glutathione peroxidase enzyme system, which is not only an, accident, an antioxidant system, but also a detoxification system, so super important stuff. I remember I used to do, I was a spokesperson for uh, some cancer organization years and years ago before I became a teacher. And one of the things we talked about, they had me go on TV and talk, talk about selenium content in food and how selenium had been linked to decreased uh, cancer risk. But um, the, the supplementation research since then, we're talking about a long time ago, um, has, not, has not panned out. But making sure you're getting enough of it in your diet, make sure you're getting enough to, to, to um, meet your needs is very important. All right, it also plays a role in the normal production of thyroid hormone and testosterone. So that's something I hadn't mentioned before. So selenium deficiency and toxicity. So the deficiency would come from living in parts of the world where the soil doesn't have selenium. Uh, that would be, so parts of China would be a good example. Kaishan disease uh, leads, to, leads to heart disease. Uh, cancer, it may be a protective factor, but it's one of those things where when we found out that selenium is important in det detoxification as an antioxidant, we thought, hey, let's just crank the levels up and, and, and nobody will get cancer. It hasn't worked, right? You have to make sure you get enough of it. Maybe uh, an optimized intake, not, not barely meeting the RDA, but um, supplementing with high doses just really hasn't panned out yet. Um, toxicity can lead to some bone issues and other things too, but uh, pretty, pretty rare. All right, copper. So now we're gonna we're gonna run through the rest of these relatively quickly. Uh, so copper is uh, transport and balance depends on a system of proteins, kind of based on needs again. Uh, roles in the body. It's a constituent of lots of enzymes uh, that reactions that consume oxygen or oxygen radicals, which your which is what your basically powers your metabolism. Uh, copper is needed for iron metabolism, which we talked about how iron uh, higher iron levels can can impact copper metabolism. Uh, defense against oxidative damage, so which would be what free radicals do. Um, so those are some of the big ones there. <clears throat> Copper deficiency, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, possibly linked to cardiovascular disease, not sure yet. Um, U.S. diets provide adequate intake, so we're just not super worried about it. Unless you're supplementing, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be reaching uh, any toxicity levels. 
There are some genetic conditions, though, that affect copper status. You see Menke's disease and Wilson's disease. Um, Wilson's disease leads to this interesting, you have to Google it, leads to this interesting copper storage that occurs in the eye, like this golden ring uh, in the eye. That's, that's kind of neat, but uh, barring those genetic conditions, we don't have any huge concerns here. Uh, let me see if I have anything else to add. So copper is an antioxidant needed for bone formation, uh, for collagen connective tissue formation, similar to vitamin C. Um, energy production, iron metabolism, nervous system function. You need two milligrams a day. It's found in chocolate, cocoa, crustaceans, shellfish, lentils, nuts and seeds, organ meats like liver, and whole grains. Um, I don't know, I think I have anything else to really add there. All right, so I guess a little bit. Uh, copper has many roles throughout the body, but is rarely seen as the key piece. Because uh, you say, I mentioned like how it's, oh, oh, that's something that zinc does, that's something vitamin C does, etc. cetera. Um, e excess zinc intake can lead to a copper deficiency. I mentioned that earlier. Organ meats are, are a great source, but other meats and seafoods also have good amounts. We talked about to uh, Wilson's disease being a, to a copper toxicity. So you do see that yellow or orange ring around the eye, but also it causes liver issues. The, the copper storage can damage the liver. All right, copper sources, legumes, whole grains, nuts, shellfish, seeds, and water delivered through copper plumbing if you happen to have it. All right, manganese. So it's mainly stored in your bones, like most other minerals, and metabolically active organs. Its roles in the body, cofactor for enzymes that facilitate metabolism. You see why it's, a, it's an important in bone formation, but the conversion of pyruvate to a TCA or Krebs cycle compound, so it is needed right there in your aerobic respiration pathways. Manganese deficiency and toxicity, so we don't need very much of it. Uh, what is the number there? Manganese, you need two milligrams a day. Again, pretty easy to find. Uh, needed in carbohydrate, protein, and cholesterol metabolism, cartilage and bone formation, and wound healing. So where can we find it? You see here on the slide it says grain products, but beans, nuts, pineapple, spinach, sweet potatoes, and whole grains are good ones. Um, Toxicity really only occurs if you're getting it from, there's too much of it in the environment. That's about all there is there. All right, so fluoride, we'll spend a little few minutes on this here. Um, so fluoride is, you know, it's famous for being found in your bones, but especially in your teeth. So it, it forms something called fluorapatite, similar to calcium hydroxyapatite, which is what your body does with calcium to make your bones and teeth stronger. Uh, it has been, uh, a deficiency has been linked to dental caries or cavities. So it's uh, the, prim the primary source of fluoride would be drinking water, but if you're using things like Culligan or reverse osmosis or uh, bottled water, they are not going to have fluoride. So you can find it in other places, but um, that, that's the it's, it's been added. Now, the, the huge majority of people don't live somewhere in the planet where the fluoride is already in the water. It's usually added, right? We have fluoridated water. Um, but what I would say here is it's okay. Like we use Culligan and we're, we don't worry about it at all. Uh, you know, my wife has perfect teeth. My, you know, my kids have normal teeth. Uh, I have one kid that's never had a cavity. So here's what we do. Um, fluoride, you know, a huge report came out in 2008 that really talked about this, um, that um, the, the majority of the benefit that we get from fluoride is, is as a topical. So, uh, I, so I don't, I'm not concerned about not having fluoride in my drinking water, but because of that, we, we, all, we use fluoridated dental products, right? Fluoride, fluoride toothpaste, but also a fluoride rinse. So me and my family, we, we use a fluoride rinse twice a day. So basically we're, we're making sure that the fluoride is getting where it's needed there on the teeth. Um, and, but that, and that's where most of the benefit comes from. So I always like to joking, you know, jokingly say that I don't drink sunscreen, right? I apply sunscreen topically. That's where it helps me. Same thing with fluoride. I, I, don't, I don't worry about not drinking it because um, we apply it topically multiple times a day. Toxicity of fluoride, which is, which is a common side effect of fluoride in the drinking water. About 10% of kids can develop fluorosis, which causes the, um, the, this, this issue with the teeth. All right, chromium, I have kind of one interesting thing to say about this, but um, so chromium's role in the body, it participates in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism, but the key thing is right there, it helps maintain glucose homeostasis. So a diabetes-like condition, hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, may result if chromium is lacking. So why do we talk about this? Because when people saw that, studies showed that not having enough chromium causes blood sugar to go up. Now all of a sudden, chromium is in every like weight loss product you find. Right? Go to GNC, go to a health food store, look at, look at the weight loss section, and you're going to see lots of things that have chromium. But here's the problem. 
If you have a chromium deficiency, your blood sugar will be high. If you treat that deficiency, your blood sugar will come down. Taking more of it doesn't, doesn't do anything, right? Doesn't help lower your blood sugar anymore. This is kind of one of those kind of scams in nutrition where they, where they took a kernel of truth about how a chromium deficiency is bad, but excess high doses of it aren't, aren't doing anything. So make sure you get enough chromium and that's it. All right, so sources are in unrefined grain, grains, uh, unrefined foods. Sorry, you see liver, brewer's yeast, whole grains. Um, so you know, mo where else could be uh, whole grains would be a more common one for most people. But uh, all right, let me find it here. So chromium needed for insulin function, protein, carbon, fat metabolism. Need 120 micrograms a day. So make sure you're getting that. But getting getting five times that isn't doing you any good. Broccoli, fruits like apples and bananas, grapes and orange juice, uh, meats, spices like garlic and basil. Turkey and whole grains, that's from the FDA site. And then on my little section that I did on chromium, I'm sure I just talked about the supplementation thing. Needed for insulin tr to transport glucose into your cells. Treating a deficiency will help with blood sugar regulation, but supplementation is rarely needed in many foods, but onions, tomatoes, and potatoes are good sources. Molybdenum, I like saying this one, uh, but not a whole lot to say about it. Uh, it is important in what are known as a class of enzymes called metalloenzymes. Dietary deficiencies are unknown, uh, so we need it, but, but it's pretty easy to find and we don't need tons of it. Um, legumes, breads, grain products, leafy green vegetables, milk and liver, and then toxicity is rare. So what does the FDA want you to know about molybdenum? Needed for enzyme production, needs 75 micrograms a day from beans and peas, nuts, and whole grains. And I don't have anything on my list about it. All right, so those are the actual trace minerals we're gonna talk about. Now we're talking about the things that get in the way, the contaminant minerals. So contaminant minerals, uh, contaminant minerals, they're generally found, they're found in the rocks and the water and the soil, the same place where you find um, the minerals you need, but they impair the body's growth, work capacity, and general health. These would be the heavy metals that, that they contaminate not just our foods, but, the, but water. They also can contaminate supplements. It's like, like, a, like a, um, with calcium supplements, for example, you can find toxic levels of cadmium in, in calcium supplements. So you always want to make sure you trust where you're getting any nutritional supplements. But lead's the big one. Lead is indestructible, meaning it's going to be with us forever. Um, it displaces nutrient minerals from metabolic sites. This is what, what leads to the damage. Children with iron deficiency are especially vulnerable. So lead, this is why, you know, the lead that was being spewed into the environment, I mean, this is why we switched from leaded to unleaded gas. This is why paint no longer has lead in it. But these issues, um, they absolutely still, um, they still are a serious problem. We have a discussion here to talk about that. There are often cases of minerals, such as lead, being found in older homes. What are the effects of lead in paint and water? Can you think of any examples where this has become an issue for a community? So lead paint used to have lead in it, and then when the old, when the old paint peels and chips off, and children are exposed to those chips, maybe eating those paint chips, that's how they get lead. And then lead in pipes would lead to lead in the water. So there's. Um, uh, maybe I'll try to link it here at the video or I'll share it in the course, but there's a video. I like to just go to YouTube and type in Little Things Matter. It's a relatively old video, but it's from a, some sort of Canadian health organization, and I, I love it. It does a great job of showing how, how exposure to things like lead impact brain development, impact IQ, impact these types of issues. So I recommend uh, trying to find that there. Um, can you think of any examples? I, I mean, we probably have all heard of this one. But many older homes have lead in the paint, which can be problematic when the paint peels and is ingested, especially for young children. I mean, I know I, I don't eat paint chips, so the people that are most likely to eat paint chips are also small, meaning that they're getting a really high dose of lead um, relative body size, and they're also still developing, right? My brain is, is wasting away uh, and no longer developing. And I think that during key times in development, these things are going to be even more impactful. For the past several years, the Flint, Michigan community has experienced toxic levels of lead in their drinking water. This is routinely on national news, as it should be, and serves as a discussion point on the dangers of lead. So lead exposure will impact brain development, will impact IQ. So yeah, check out that video. All right, and that is that. Now the lesson is over. Show have, have we met our goals? Summarize key factors unique to the trace minerals. Yep. Identify the main roles, deficiency symptoms, and food sources for each of the essential trace minerals. Iron, zinc, iodine, selenium, copper, manganese, fluoride, chromium, and molybdenum. Yep. And describe how contaminant minerals disrupt, disrupt body processes and impair nutritional status, especially lead. Absolutely. Okay. We're done talking about vitamins and minerals. Now we're going to move into a section on like physical activity and nutrition through the lifespan and global nutrition as we, as we near the end. I hope this helps, as always. Have a wonderful day.
Be blessed.